This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. While I was attending the Blackpool Convention recently this year in 2024, I wanted to speak with so many people, and I did during the daily convention reports, but I really intended to sit down with a few people to have an in-depth conversation, but I really only got the chance to do it with one person, and I'm glad I did, because Ian Rowland is someone who we have gotten together from time to time when he has been to the States over for Magic Live and a few other places that we've seen each other, but really never had the chance to sit down for a while. I uh, love this guy. He's... uh, a lot of fun, very intelligent, got a lot of great background as far as even being classical guitar player. We, he loves music. But aside from that, is a, a wonderful author and speaker and magician and mentalist. And uh, basically, he considers himself as an author, really, as his full-time job. And so this week, he is offering one lucky listener a copy of one of three of his books on cold reading. And if you have any interest in that at all, and I think everybody should, regardless if you're a mentalist or a magician or whatever, there are some very important things in uh, the books, uh, all of them. But you get to uh, make your choice of one of three books if you happen to be a lucky winner and your name is randomly drawn. So I want to thank uh, Ian up front to begin with for offering this great prize. And this is offered to anyone who is not only in the U.S., but if you're in the U.K., if you're in Europe or Canada, uh, this will be delivered to you postpaid. So this is uh, compliments of uh, Ian, and I want to thank him very much for that. And make sure you go to themagicwordpodcast.com this week where you will see the form you can complete. Uh, Let me just also point out this is going to be a very limited and short contest. Typically, I run this for a couple of weeks, but due to a variety of factors, this is only going to run for about a week. So hurry and enter, uh, not often, only enter once. (laughs) You only get to have uh, one chance to uh, win. And I don't care how many email addresses that you have, uh, you can only enter once, please, wherever you are around the, the world. But wait, there's more. In case you do enter and you don't happen to win, or for whatever reason you do not wish to enter the contest, and why wouldn't you if you get a chance to win a free book, you can also receive some free stuff. You can get some free books and you could download from his website. So he encourages you to go to ianroland.com slash magic. That's I-A-N. R-O-W-L-A-N-D dot com slash magic, M-A-G-I-C. And if you go to the website there, you will see some opportunities where you can download some free books. And also, you might want to take a look at the one thing he does sell, which is called Think Link, which is a super cool trick. And you can see some of the testimonials of people who are saying how great this really is. And let me kind of chime in then as well. It is a great trick. You might want to consider purchasing that from him as well, since he's given us all this really cool stuff. Again, ianroland.com slash magic. Well, Ian has a lot to say to us here this week, and I'm going to step out of this way and let him do most of this talking here this week. So please welcome my guest, Mr. Ian Rowland, here on The Magic Word. For a long time, I've been wanting to talk uh, at length with my guest here today, who is Ian Rowland. He and I have been friends for a long number of years, and I have seen him at Magic Live in Vegas from time to time. And if you've gone back and listened to some of those podcast episodes that were reports from the convention, uh, you can hear uh, us talking. Usually there's a lot of background with other people talking because it's hard to uh, get him aside for a minute because he's in such demand. Everybody's wanting to talk with him. Specifically, he has these amazing cards that he uh, it's not origami, it's karagami, in which he actually cuts a little bit. Well, we'll get into that. It's amazing, in which he was had a feature article that was in Genie Magazine some uh, year or so ago, which I would recommend that you go back to if uh, you ha- keep your genies uh, or go into their archives in order to take a look, actually, at some of these photos. And also, I'll have uh, pictures on the magicwordpodcast.com website, so this way uh, you can see that. Because when we were at the Magic Circle recently, and Ian and I were talking, he displayed them, put them out, so he 
you kind of get to see them. Fine. Well, my point is, I never got a chance really to sit down with him for a proper sit down. And so now's the time we happen to do it because I'm over in England right now getting ready for the Black Bull Convention. And it's going to be beginning very soon. But I wanted to uh, talk with Ian. And uh, we have known each other, golly, since uh, I'd probably say the first time that we really met was during a the magic mental what was that called? The mental, uh, it doesn't mental matter. asylum was it? Mental something? asylum. That was yeah. it. Mental, mental asylum. And that was uh, a fun event that we did. And, uh, that was the first time that Banachek and I had dinner and got to meet and spend time with, uh, David Berglis. So that was a momentous occasion. Anyhow, a lot of things that, uh, Ian does that I think is important that you need to know about him. If you, uh, haven't seen, met, or know much about him, we're going to get into a lot of that because he's been a corporate speaker for a long time. He's, uh, actually one person, the first, only person to, uh, be out outside the U.S. has ever been hired by FBI agents and was not for something that he did, but for something they wanted him to to do, I guess. But again, he has uh, been a corporate speaker. And one of the things, too, I remember when we were at that um, uh, mental asylum uh, convention, uh, he was talking about the full facts book of cold reading. And that is a very successful, perhaps the most successful books published on the fact or the, the topic of cold reading in, in history. And I think he's got a couple of versions of that uh, out since. He's had like three different books, I believe, uh, that, that are out. And so he is an expert on cold reading. And like myself, he's a member of the Inner Magic Circle Gold Star. And he had worked with Eddie Izzard over here on the BBC. He's helped a lot of companies, again, through his motivational speaking and corporate involvement. And also he was in the corporate market for a long time as a head of sales and marketing for an IT company. And he loves music, but who who else doesn't? But he also actually, in addition to mu- just liking it, he plays classical t- guitar. What a well-rounded person. I want you to get to know my friend as I do. Please welcome Ian Rowland. Hey there, Ian. Well, uh, first of all, can everybody just lower their expectations? Because <laughs> that's one of those introductions no one can live up to. That's really, really kind of you. And I do like the fact well, that... Well, that was my deep research no, that, that I did that, on that you. Was, it was great. Usually, that's all that I do. I don't do any more research than that. It, it was more than enough. It was very kind. And I, I I like the fact that we've known each other basically since forever. You know, yeah, since the like. flood. And uh, I, I wondered, you know, when I was younger, I, was, I wondered how I would feel when I got to that point in my life where all my anecdotes started, well, yeah, about 30 years ago, and, <laughs> yeah, I've known this guy for 25 years, and now you're there. Yeah, and I kind of like it. You know, I, 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 I sometimes tell anecdotes about stuff that happened in the 90s or the 80s. You know, of course, if there's any young people present yes. or any te- teenagers, yep. you know, they just kind of have that blank look. Like when you show them a picture of a rotary dial phone, you know, it's, it's that sort of... <laughs> You were alive then in ancient history, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's great, and because I, I think one of the things we'll get onto is that the longer you spend in this beautiful, fantastic community, the magic community, the more friends and the more great people like you that mm-hmm. you meet. And so now, I you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of <clears throat> going to lots of different places and traveling a lot and meeting lots of great people. So I, I kind of like the fact that I'm just an old gray dinosaur. I don't mind being an old gray dinosaur. Well, you have traveled a lot. And when yeah. you go to these other countries, so do you uh, do lectures and talk to the magicians or are you just going for the fun of it? Like when you go to see, I don't know, the Great Wall or wherever you'd be traveling. Um, it, it's astonishing that you mentioned the Great Wall. I gave you this long, long list of all the stuff I've been to all around the world and that's not one of them. <laughs> yeah. <It's okay. laughs> well, things like no, no, that. No, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the but that's on your bucket list. I guess. The, the, <laughs> oh, my bucket list goes on forever. Um, I've been very lucky. Uh, the magic world has given me the opportunity to travel, particularly between in my sort of golden decade between 2000 and 2010, when the the cold reading book was doing really well, and lots of people liked me and liked the book, and so I got invitations to go all sort all sorts of places. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that more or less uh, yep. a, a bit more later on, but. But then on, on top of that, I was able to do a lot of traveling for leisure and pleasure and uh, just fulfill some ambitions. And uh, Easter Island, where they have the giant stone heads, you know, the famous, uh, that had been an ambition of mine for about 25 or 30 years, ever since I first read about really? the, the okay. Contiki. That was one of your bucket list things. Yeah, yeah, it was. And uh, ever since I read the, the Contiki expedition in my teens. And so when I was finally there, but... When did I go to Easter Island? I timed my visit so I'd be there over Christmas because oh. because it's funnier. <laughs> funnier. It'd it's be Easter, Easter Island, Island for Christmas. Christmas. Okay. And um, well, why not be at Easter what, Island for Easter? I know. Yeah. 
So when I was um, there on Christmas morning, listening to a uh, favorite, favorite, favorite piece of music at sunrise on Easter Island, that, that felt like uh, a really great you know, box to tick. And it was a wonderful experience. So yes, a lot of it's been for pleasure. A lot of it's just been for curiosity. Uh, and I've had great times absolutely everywhere I've been. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just really love... Uh, What's your favorite? It's hard to say. I mean, it's like trying to pick favorite children. But I mean, so Easter Island was certainly a highlight. I went to Komodo Island in Indonesia to see those giant, what they call Komodo Komodo dragons. dragons, the the, the Big lizards, yeah. Yeah, the largest reptiles in the world. About the size of a twin bed. They're they're, they're massive. And uh, that was, again, was just, it was so... In the wild. I I mean, not like in a zoo, but out in the wild. Oh, no, no. There's no zoos there. They're not allowed to do that. And again, it was just such a massive cultural and cognitive shift in my head the first time you actually you know you're having a guided tour or whatever and you actually see one of these prehistoric beasts lumbering yeah. towards you yeah uh, a creature that has no predators obviously and has four ways of instantly killing you it's just a wonderful experience i know it's jaws apparently are well, yeah, but if it bites you, the stuff that they put into your blood is is toxic. It's going to slow you down and kill you within an hour. Plus, uh, they've got spines and spikes and claws. Plus, if they get one thwack of the tail, you're 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 you're, you're toast. You're done. Well, wow. so um, that was great. Uh, I like that. I've had great times in Australia, Canada, the state. I mean, in a way. It's difficult to name any of these places because there might be some friends of mine listening from the ones that I don't name. And <laughs> That's then, right, you know, leaving like, them out. I yeah. get a week of emails like, oh, you didn't mention Sweden. <laughs> but no, I've had great times everywhere I went. And I, I just so, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that essentially comes back down to an interest in magic, which comes back down to seeing one guy do one trick on TV when I was seven. So from there to there was an amazing line. But I mean, if I mean to visit Hiroshima mm-hmm. and to wow. see the Peace Memorial Park and to see what's done there now, uh, I mean that is so moving. Yeah, I took my kids to Berlin and to see the wall the and to see some wall, of the, you yeah, know, the, you know yeah. the things you know that had happened back then. That was quite moving. These too. things are very moving, and you really start. You, you don't have to be a poet or a philosopher, but you, ha- you start having lots of thoughts about human nature Mortality. and what we're actually doing on this world, and and the, some of the horrors that we've inflicted on one another. So uh, some of it's moving, some of it's beautiful. I've met great people, of course. Do you seek uh, out magicians when you go on, on intentionally or you call them in advance or you just kind of while you're there? Sometimes. I mean, it depends on the trip. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, very often. I, I, yeah, I love the fact that the magic community is everywhere. It is. And um, you're never that far away from magician. And if, I, if it's appropriate for the trip, sure. I mean, I'll announce on social media, hey, I'm going to be around. Does anybody want to meet up and, and have fun? Uh, and there always is. There are always uh, some people, and some people are very kind, and they act as hosts and things. So I love the magic community. I don't like it. I love it. I love the people I've met. I've uh, been lucky enough to meet. I've had all kinds of fun. It's led to traveling, and sometimes those two things mix, uh, mix very well. Now, you have been a mentalist, because I was mentioning earlier about the um, uh, mental asylum and the uh, books you've read on, uh, written on cold reading, and I want to get into cold reading here uh, soon. But as far as uh, getting into magic and the mentalism world, mm. those are really two separate worlds, and you've only really been in magic, if you will, doing close-up for the past short few years, right? Essentially doing close-up, at least. Um, doing close-up in shows is quite recent. I mean, I've always loved close-up magic, especially with cards, but also you can do some great close-up mentalism. That's of fantastic. Yeah. Um, but just what happened over the last year was that they, they do ma- uh, close-up shows at the Magic Circle, mm-hmm. which I wasn't part of. And then last year, I started taking part in those and really love those as well. They're great because you get to go along. The way it works is uh, you, they get their, their audience in, um, four magicians, so we all do about 20 to 25 minutes. And so you get to work with three of your friends, you know, and, and see uh, your, your friends do their stuff and they get to see yours. And there's a lot of peer group respect and a lot of mutual love and the audiences have a great time. And it's just a tremendously happy sort of evening to be part of and to be able to make a contribution to. Yeah. But again, the two worlds colliding. I mean, the mentalism and magic kind of overlap. And I was just talking with uh, Ken Weber on a, a recent episode that if you go back, you can listen to that. And I specifically asked him about how magic and mentalism has melded together. And he said more so here recent years than it was from before. They used to really be much more separate, uh, certainly. And now every magician also calls himself 
a mentalist or puts <laughs> mentalism into a show or something, you know. Yeah. Well, of course, over here, we've had the Darren Brown effect. Uh, I, Just like the Uri Geller effect in Israel. Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky. I, uh, I met Darren uh, two or three years before he became famous yeah. and became a TV star. We get to hang out and everything. Uh, an amazing man. I'm very, very happy for his success. I... Before it all happened. He's a household I, name here in the UK. Oh, absolutely. I, I went to a play last night in the West End, and there was some lady. I was just talking with her about the West End plays, and, and I was talking about magic, and she she mentioned Darren Brown. It's yes. like, you know Darren Brown? <laughs> wow. Well, the thing is, even though it's been a while now, and this, by the way, is his choice and his production team's choice. It's been a while since he was on TV. He could be on TV whenever he wants. Yeah. But even now, they can sell out any theatrical venue. Wow. In the UK, even the big, the, you know, the 2000 seats, the 3000 seats, the top Western theaters. And when I was growing up, I just never thought I'd live to see the day when somebody doing mentalism, let alone magic, could sell out one of the top Western theaters. And of course, the theaters are delighted because normally they have to do a lot of work to put on a play or a musical. Right. Or the, whereas this is basically he said, table, a hey. couple of chairs and a microphone and you're, you're right. done, you know, right. but they're making the same money. It's, <laughs> they love it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's great. And he's and they had, don't have to do a lot of advertising because they know the name. I mean, it's that's right. kind of like, I guess, when Paul Daniels would come Absolutely. in and do something. Uh, it's one of these, you can just put the name on the marquee and you're going to sell the tickets. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very happy for his success. I've seen uh, several, if not all, of his live shows, and they're all superbly put together by Darren and his team. Mm -hmm. And what bringing an mentalism, team. yeah, bringing mentalism to the, to the masses in a way that I honestly didn't think was going to happen in my lifetime. It's great to see it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's great to see it. I mentioned Paul Daniels and also about him having such a great name. Are, mm. Is there anybody then else besides Darren and Paul who could put their name on a marquee and have that kind of drawing power in the UK currently? I know Dynamo's not, he's kind of gotten out of magic or he's not as involved as he once was or? He, uh, Dynamo, uh, uh, hi Dynamo, if you're listening, um, he, he he just broke really big over here as absolutely massive success. I think he took a break for health reasons, mm. and he's mo he had a TV special just uh, uh, last year. And I I'm sure if he wants to get back into that, I don't. It's not what everybody wants to do all the time. Sure, if that's what he wants to do, I'm sure he will. He can. He's still a very popular name, uh, very very loved, and uh, quite rightly so. Again, a fantastically talented magician, and uh, I remember him from his old. It was just Steve Frey, you know, just, just taking part in the International Magic Studio close-up comp and things like that. Uh, again, goes back years. Once you get to be a grey old dinosaur, you remember everybody from what they were like when they were kids. But yeah, great success, great for magic, good for the reputation of magic, mm -hmm. very positive. And hopefully, you hope these things have a knock-on effect, that they will encourage more people, more young people to get into magic, join the circle or their local club, and, uh, you know, just swell the ranks of this fantastic beautiful community that I love so much. It is a rich tapestry uh, that we have that uh, has so many different colors and uh, it is it, it's a beautiful thing for uh, us and we're lucky to be in here. Like you say, that you're grateful to have had magic as an opportunity then to allow you to travel and uh, the world and, and do what you're wanting to do. And so as a professional, you have been a writer then too. Can you tell us a little bit more really about uh, that side of your life, you know, what it is you write? I mean, I know I talked earlier about the cold reading book, but I'm sure there have been some other things you've done that have Oh, this is my whole life. That's okay. what I am. I'm not a magician or a maker. I never author. have been. You consider yourself? I'm an amateur dabbler. I'm a hobbyist. Okay, so you're, you're, you're the, the William Shakespeare of magic. I have no idea what that means. Um, <laughs> no, I'm a writer by trade. That's my job. That's what I've been doing for 40 odd years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've always enjoyed writing. I know that for most people, it's a bit of a chore, a bit of a, you know, I have to write that thing. I love writing. I do too. Um, I just I do, flow. It's kind of like talking, you know. It's yeah, yeah. I've just got the right sort of mind for it. As anybody who knows me well will tell you, I'm no good at anything else, but I'm 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 okay with writing. But all I mean by that is, if you're good enough at something to earn a living for uh, doing it for forty years, I think you can. I think you can give yourself reasonably good credit. Yeah. Um. So that's what I've done ever since uh, I, I finished my school days. Uh. You know, back in the 1980s, we had this thing called the video, corporate video production industry, which has died now. But uh, back then, uh, you had these companies that were just making these corporate videos uh, to promote this or that. 
And I, I started working for those. I had to research these scripts and then uh, write the script and present them to the client and then go out and produce the video. And it required, in those days, it required a lot of kits and equipment and a mm-hmm. sort of room full of stuff just to edit them. Uh, so, so much that, easier today. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And uh, that's how I got my start and then a couple of other things. And I was writing financial reports. And then I found my niche. Um, I, I got it. I went to an interview with an IT company in the uh, very nice uh, area of London, Highbury and Islington. And I got a job as a technical writer before I knew what a technical writer was. This is, this is absolutely true. I went for this interview and I got on very well with a, a guy who went on to be a really great manager. And again, very lucky. How many people can say that about where they were, that they like their manager, their manager? But he was great. A guy, a guy called Brian. Um, he took me on, took a chance on me. And uh, I thrived in that job. I loved it. I, I'm, I'm sure I have some sort of mild degree of autism or whatever it is. But to be a technical writer, you essentially, as well as being able to write, you need a level of attention to detail. It's just absurd. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure if you, if you put me in a helicopter over Wembley Stadium, I could count the blades of grass. You know, it's that sort of level of detail. That's what you need. And, um, a little bit OCD. Yeah, yeah, just a little. <laughs> and I loved it. I, I was, again, it was a great company. As I said, had a lovely manager. I loved the work. It was uh, pretty well paid what it was and uh, ready-made social life. So I've always enjoyed writing, even, even writing that other kind of other no, I think normal people would regard as really boring and dull. I thought, no. And, you know, if somebody comes, and these days I ghost write books. So I've written pretty much everything you can do in the corporate sphere, mm-hmm. marketing and promotional and advertising and sales and live presentations and this, that, and the other, anything that you can do with words, user manuals, branch management manuals. I've written the whole lot. Then I started working for myself in 1997, 98. Uh, so doing my own thing and getting contracts here and there. And um, yes, I've written a few books for myself. And these days I even ghost write books for other people, mm. which is again, great fun. Um, in the magic community or outside uh, corporate? Outside. Or? Okay. Uh, I mean, both. I've done both. And I, I really love it. I, I do understand that for a lot of people, that would look like really boring work. But for me, I love it. And if somebody comes along and says, I've got a 160,000 word book that needs editing, or I'd like you to write. I say, fine, bring it on. I'm happy. Yeah, I'll sit down at my desk and make a cup of tea. And well, they've got it. AI that can do that now. No, they haven't. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what are your, what are your thoughts on AI writing? books and things i'm surprised that anybody seriously thinks it's a threat but we're still in its infancy sure. let's say 15 years from now yeah when it's going to be i think everywhere okay so two reasons why that's not true okay um so please don't swallow the mythology ai is great i love what it can do with art and ai generated art and so on and there is ai writing and there's chat gpt and all these things right two reasons why i'm not scared Apart from the fact that I'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're looking healthy now, but good luck. I hope you last a lot longer. <laughs> hey, when I get out of here, I've got to cross the road in London streets. I mean, anything Okay, well, happen, that's a good know. point there. So, um, first of all... Be sure to look to your left. I, 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 it's, it, I look both ways. That's the way I was taught. <laughs> so, first of all, if you don't think there's an essential human component to good writing, then I don't know what writing you've been looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say... Wait for the day that AI can produce Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Hmm. Have a look at Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, and you tell me that an AI generating system is ever going to come up with that. Mm -hmm. You look at um, Breakfast at Tiffany's by Truman Capote and tell me that AI is ever going to come up with that. You look at um, uh, Oleana, uh, uh, you know, fantastic books and plays. AI is not going to come up with that because you have to have a human brain behind it. Uh, a human mind. Secondly, and this is the important one for me as a trade, as a writer by profession, you can't argue with a chat bot. People love to argue with a writer. Mm-hmm. They, once you do the first draft, they love to sit down and say, I don't think you've quite put enough detail in here. They love to have a good art, and you can't do that with a machine. Mm-hmm. And so they'll always prefer the human touch. Also, they miss out the joy, the sheer joy and pleasure of dealing with me. Mm. Okay. That's why you're supposed to chime in with massive agreement well, there. Sure, well, I agree with so that. Don't, well, <laughs> let's just go again. So, uh, uh, apart from which, they'll miss out on the the sheer joy and happiness of dealing with me. Of dealing with you. Yes. Okay. I still not quite sure you're landing that one. It's got <laughs> quite right. Look, well, we'll do that. We'll fix it in the edit. Carry on. <laughs> 
Uh, I do want to go back for just a second because I said look to the left. Actually, you look to the right here, don't you? You look both ways. You look both ways. Both ways. ways. (laughs) Be the better way. Um, But the Scott Wells Guide to Road Safety is on (laughs) sale from from a a mortuary near you, (laughs) from a funeral home near you. Uh, but as far as cold reading goes, hmm. that uh, the first book that you had written on that, that came from your experience because do you cold read pretty much everybody? Like when you're at a coffee shop or when you're anywhere, do you kind of look around and aware of your surroundings at all times or just when you're performing or? Um, well, let's just take those separately. Um, the origins of the book the, was was I was hugely interested in cold reading from my teens. So my, my mentor... Explain cold reading for just a few people who might not understand what that is we're talking how about. To, so cold reading is how to talk to people so you sound psychic. Okay. That's it. Like you know something about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so my great mentor in my teenage years was the genius that walks among us known as David Brickland. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did a great deal for my interest in magic and taught me all sorts of things I didn't know. And you know how pretty much everything in in... in in the terms of teaching magic, is kind of effect method, effect method, right? You know, that's how it goes sure, in the sure. books and the lectures. Yep. So he taught me a great deal of stuff and was trying to introduce me uh, to different things and broaden my interest. And he did a great job, and I'm, I'm always grateful to him. And one day he got around to talking about cold reading. And he said, well, you know, you can, let's say you have some tarot cards or something, and you sit down with a complete stranger, and then you give them a, a reading, and it all seems to make sense, and people go away thinking you knew all about them. I said, okay, that, yeah, that's a really cool effect. Yeah, fine. So, uh, come on, what's the method? How's it done? And he said, well, um, there kind of isn't one. Like, the effect is the method. You just kind of learn how to do it. I said, no, come on, David, this is me. You can, you can, you can level with me. How's it done? What's the trick? He said, no, seriously, there really is one. Well, you just kind of learn how to do it the right way. So I became fascinated because it didn't fit that pattern, effect and method. You know, effect. oh, there's a force and then there's a switch. Right. No. So I gathered all of the information that I possibly could. And I, I again, I need to play the, the faded old dinosaur card here. This was before the internet. Mm-hmm. I think we need to pause there for a few seconds for younger listeners. There was, was such a time. a time as before the internet. So this would have been like in the early 90s, yes, um, late 80s, uh, a while back. All of it, all of it. <laughs> and I gathered everything I could. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I used to sort of see adverts and I'd, I'd write off to someone who had a little pamphlet in Argentina or something. And it would come back through the mail, you know, three weeks later. And I ended up with this bookshelf full of sources and books and pamphlets and leaflets. And I noticed, well, there's a couple of good ideas in that one. And then that's a really good idea in that little leaflet. Oh, and that book has three or four good ideas. Wouldn't it be nice if only someone had gathered all these good ideas together and kind of put some organization, some structure to them and, and like and analyze why it all works and, and categorize all the different techniques? And this was just where the rise of the internet was coming, and I noticed that people were actually selling stuff online. And um, I like writing books, as I said. So you know what? I'll I'll have a go. I'll I'll try writing a book and selling it online. Uh, and I th- I'm being honest with you, and I'm being honest with our lovely listeners. I thought I might sell about fifty copies. Mm-hmm. I thought that's how many people. You see. And you, you weren't self-published. I mean, yeah, I was. It, yeah, okay, all, all self-published. But it was different back then, as far as how you publish today yeah, versus you had then. To actually, so, get physical copies. So how many copies did you go to print with? Like five hundred or something? Or? No, no, I, I just did it in a high street copy shop. I oh, wow. got about a hundred copies done. I think okay. I, I thought I'd sell about fifty, and I um, that 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 was my because you've got the whole magic world, and then a subset of that is mentalism, Correct. and then a subset of that is people who are interested in cold reading, and then a subset of that is people who actually want to buy a book on it. So I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe fifty copies, mm-hmm. and so I, I did the first edition and put it out, and people were very kind and reviewed it nicely, and it just sold and sold and sold, but not just to the magic and mentalism community. People were buying it all over the world, and. Uh, Great things happen when you publish a book. Uh, I, I, it's something I very, I'm very passionate about. I get evangelical about it. I encourage people to choose a subject, put a book out, put your name on it. One that has more, I'm not just talking about f- appealing to the magic community. Choose a subject that more people are interested in. And you've got the entire English-speaking world as your audience. Mm-hmm. And it's a really, really good idea. Really good thing to do. 
And of course, like if if they're adept with that, then that have the sort of mindset you and I have. That's great. If not, obviously I can help, but I'm not doing this to pitch for business. There's lots of people who can help you write a book. And it's a really good idea. Your book becomes your roving ambassador around the world. You don't know quite where it's going to end up. People sell each other books, they buy books, they good lend point. them, they borrow them, they leave them lying around in waiting rooms and stuff. You never know where it's going to end up. And a lot of people around the world will meet your book before they meet you. And it leads to things and it opens doors and uh, it, it's just fantastic. And when I normally try to evangelize people about doing this, I share three things that happened out of thousands, three things that happened after I did the, the first book. Is it okay if I mention them? Please do. This is, some of this might come across as if I'm self-aggrandizing. I'm not. I'm sharing these stories with you. I just want to encourage people when you write a book and stamp your name in it choose a subject that you can talk usefully about put your book put your name in it write a book great things happen let me share three stories first of all a man in australia flew me to australia and back you and i sitting in england right now flew me to australia and back first class for one gig (laughs) okay Did he had seen you one, perform somewhere, or uh, we'd met in London. We'd book. had dinner, okay. and uh, he, I said, you know, I've, I've never, I've never got on a plane and like turned left to go into the first class section. And he said, oh, I, I can, I can make that happen for you. So he had a budget because he he was uh, a top guy at one of the top universities there, and he had a budget. So he made it happen, and we we yeah, I had a wonder a wonderful trip, and I was able to see all of my friends in Australia. Uh, so that kind of thing. Somebody getting me a therabat in luxury in first class. Uh, also, I got a phone call once from a, a lovely woman in Canada who said she loved my first cold reading book and it was really useful to her in her job. I said, what do you do? She said, I'm a hand therapist. I didn't even know this job existed. Okay, right? what does that mean? Uh, I still no idea, really. Okay. But uh, I, I'm Because I'm, I'm very astute and sharp and on the uptake, I'm assuming it's got something to do with hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're, with therapy. you're sharp. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see it's how sharp I am. You can mm. see my reputation. I see why people yeah, yeah, would want yeah, to yeah, yeah. talk with you. And <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I, <clears throat> so not only were people buying this book that had nothing to do with the typical market you would expect, but I mean, it, it, it's people you don't even know exist. Um, and the third nice thing that, that, that happened was, of course, the FBI gig. I'm uh, just about to say the know, FBI because... Uh, I got this uh, email in 2010 saying, hello, would you please come and train our agents? And of course, I thought it was a prank, mm. clearly, mm. but it turned out not to be. So choose a subject you can talk about knowledge with that's, that's got a broad appeal, stamp your name in it, write a book, put it out there. You never know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But you do know more good things are going to happen than if you'd never written the book. Mm-hmm. So I also get a takeaway from that is always say yes to opportunities. Opportunities not, because not everybody answers. That's right. Some people say, well, I've got something else, or yeah. I don't know if I really want to do that. The first way is yes, and let me see how I can move things around or make something, make that opportunity work for you then as well. Uh, talk about the FBI. That was when mm. I was thinking about profilers, and that's kind of what a person who has these skills as a good cold reader would be able to um, to, to, to go there, you know. But uh, in, in cold reading, it, when it makes you seem like a psychic or you know something mm. uh, about people, are there some general tips that you can give us? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Monty Python team had a famous sketch called Summarize Proust in 10 Seconds. Uh, <laughs> same sort of thing. No, look, um, not everybody listening to this will be particularly interested. I, what interested me was the fundamental proposition in cold reading, right? Mm-hmm. So in real life, how does it go? If you meet someone socially that you know, and you know a bit about them, then you start to uh, make statements and, and, and refer to the things you know, like how's the family? How are the kids? How are the twins doing? Uh, did, oh, I'm sorry to hear you were in hospital recently. You're okay now. Uh, how's everything down at the accountancy firm? You know, mm-hmm. Because you know stuff, right? right? If you meet a stranger... We all just make small talk and ask questions because we don't know anything about them. Correct. Oh, uh, I, I've come a long way. Who do you know here? Oh, how do you know Scott? Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Cold reading, just think about the joy of this. You're meeting a complete stranger and you're going to talk about their life mm-hmm. 
past, present, and future, uh, statements about their character, events, whatever. You're making statements that for, for three minutes, five minutes, right. 20 minutes. I mean, that exhilarated and excited me when David Britland first told me about it. I thought, to be able to do that, mm -hmm. how can you not be interested in how this is done? So this is when I developed this manic interest in it and started doing it, which is the important thing. You can't, I mean, a lot of people just want to read about it. That's like trying to get really good at swimming by reading books or, you know, or, or, or playing or, the guitar. Or watch stealing. You yeah. have to actually yeah. do it. You have to do it. And so now I, uh, I'm at a very happy stage. I use the system that I, I I'm not here to advertise books, but um, the system that I put in my second book, Super Psychic Readings. And it's how to give any kind of reading to anyone anywhere. And I've done this all over the world. There's lots of little anecdotes and stories in that book about great times I've had. Uh, it's a really fun thing to do. I, I understand people's concerns about it negatively, by the way. The, they've heard about stories exploiting other people through cold reading mm. and, and making money. Right. Um, I you can, can start a cult. <laughs> uh, well, okay. But I've never charged any money. For me, it's, it's a social thing that I do to make a nice contribution to somebody's life for a day, uh, mm. uh, for, for a few minutes. And, you know, um, I'm not going to try to get too saccharine or, or maudlin about it, but I know many, many times when I've done this, and it's been the nicest thing that's happened to that person all day Absolutely. or possibly all week. Exactly. Um, you never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. If, if you have a, a nice, happy, go-getting, fulfilling life, that's great. But there are some people, there's a lot of walking wounded out there, and there's a lot of people who have problems that you can't necessarily see. And I remember... Um, I've often told this story before, but I was coming back um, from Sweden through the airport or the station at Malmö in southern Sweden. And it was the middle of the afternoon, it was about three or four o'clock, and there was a young girl there serving tea and coffee. And it wasn't busy. I need to emphasize that. It was a very quiet part of the day. And uh, I got talking to her and I gave her a short reading, uh, which she really liked. And she said, oh, that was really nice of you. And I thought she was referring to the cold reading bit. Mm -hmm. And I explained, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, some people take it seriously, some people take it as a bit of fun, but I just thought it's a nice thing to do. She said, no, 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 I mean, you talked to me. It's the first time today somebody's done that. Hmm. You know, everybody else had just come up to her, said, ordered what they want, cappuccino, or whatever, thrown the money or whatever, right. and just left. She said, you're the first person who's actually talked to me like I'm here. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a human being rather yeah. than just a coffee maker. So I've seen that story played out time and time and time and time again and giving these short little readings. Or sometimes people want a longer reading. It's fine. And I'm happy to do it. As I say, for me, it's not something that I charge money for. But I see it as a way of, because with cold reading, the, the other person is the star. They're the celebrity. With magic, like, I'm the magician, not what I can do. Ta-da! Round of applause. But with cold reading, it's the other way around. I'm, I'm just trying to interpret the cards for you or whatever system I'm using. Mm. The, the, the person you're doing the reading for is the star. They're the one who's important. They get to be the star Very for a personal. moment. Mm -hmm. And they feel good about it. And they suddenly feel that somebody's actually taking an interest in them. Plus, we all always tend to accentuate the positive a little bit. And it can give people a nice positive nudge in the right direction, you know, and, and a little bit of self-belief as well. So I see it as a nice thing you can do a kind thing you can do that makes people feel good about themselves. And I'm all in favor of that because there's plenty of forces and influences around in today's society that contrive and conspire to make people feel unhappy about themselves. So if we can redress the balance a little bit and just do things that make people believe themselves a bit more, I'm all in favor of that. And that's for me what cold reading is. Yeah, I think that's very important that you can also do this without the aid of anything known in cards or coins. It's not a magic trick. It's something, again, you're not, you're giving them a pleasant experience, but it's a personalized experience. I, a story I've told, I think, in the past, uh, some people may not have heard me tell this, but I was uh, traveling once uh, with another fella and we were uh, checking into a hotel late in the evening. And the guy just mentioned to the lady behind the counter that I was a magician. And so I said, why don't you show her a short trick? And I said, sure, okay. Well, I had an invisible deck with me. And I said, I want you just to think of any card, whatever it happens to be. And she did. And then uh, I you know, had the cards in front of her, just the deck. And so uh, I remember it like it was last night. She said the four of clubs. Well, let me backtrack a little bit. And in a, a book that was important to me was Forbidden Wisdom. And I don't remember who the author was, but it had different things on each page about how to do 
cold reading, psychic readings, and these kinds of things. And this one page was talking about, okay, that clubs, hearts, and diamonds made these certain things, and then the numbers would be associated with something right. else. In this particular case, clubs meant like a club. You belong to something, and so therefore you're a social person. Uh, so I kind of went down that route, and also a four happened to mean travel. And so I said, you're probably going to be traveling with somebody, and it was a very short thing. I probably didn't know about 30 seconds, maybe <laughs> to a full minute. Right. And and her eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger, and then uh, whenever I turned the cards over and I said, and there's only one card upside down, which is your card, the four of clubs. And she said, how'd you know that? And I said, well, I'm a mind reader. And she said, no, I mean, how'd you know that I'm going to be going to England with my, with my sister in six months from now? Yeah. I mean, she was the one who made that leap yeah. to something much more specific than the broad thing that I was talking about, travel with friends because yeah. you're social. Yeah. You know, basically kind of thing. And it was something, obviously, like you just pointed out then, Ian, that not only was that something I'm sure that she remembered for that day, that that was probably the most important thing for that week. And I'm sure she told her cousin or whoever it is she was traveling with and probably told that story for a long time. Yeah, I, I, you're giving people good memories and good experiences. And I, I, I think... When you have an ethical approach to it, it can be a very positive thing to do. Mm -hmm. See, um, James Randi always used to make this point. I mean, it's, it's whenever you study law, they start off with the example of the sharp knife or the surgeon's knife. It can be used for good or for evil. Mm -hmm. You know, you can mm -hmm. harm people point. with it yeah. or you can use save it to life. save somebody's life. And so it's never that X is good or bad. It's how you use it and the intention behind it and your personal ethics. So I, I'm well aware of the negative side of cold reading and, and telling people, somebody's put a spell on you, I can lift the spell, but it's going to take you $5,000, you know. Yeah. I'm, don't, I'm not in favor of that. I, I'm talking about nice experiences and positive experiences, and like you say. And these days, um, you know, uh, EDC, everyday carry, is, is one of the new bits of jargon amongst the younger uh, yeah. followers. But cold reading is the ultimate EDC because you just carry it around in your head the whole time. And... Um, if I may mention just one short story, I took this fantastic trip around Latin America a few years ago. And for part of the trip when I was in Rio, uh, I got to hang out with David Dean, the mind artist. And he's a really great, talented cold reader as well. But he and I have very different systems. He He's a master of uh, stock lines. He's got, I don't know, I don't know how many he's got. He's got thousands of lines mm. in his head for every kind of demographic group. Yeah, uh, My system's based on memorization not uh, sorry improvisation not memorization okay i love the fact that i just fluffed the line about memorization that's really that's a that's a sign of my age mm -hmm. so yeah my system's entirely based on <laughs> improvisation not memorization so we do it differently and we everywhere we went mm -hmm. we were giving readings and i got a chance to see him do his thing and he got a chance to see me do my thing and we could compare notes afterwards it was the most amazing fun wow and there was a, I needed to buy a, a t-shirt at one point. We went into this uh, shop not far from the beach. And again, I want to emphasize, we weren't disrupting people when they were busy. This was a quiet part of the afternoon. There was a couple yes. of young women working in the shop there. They were pretty bored. And uh, I, I didn't need to speak Portuguese to know that they would both have rather been anywhere else on the face of the planet than in that <laughs> shop. Anyway, with a little bit of David's help as an interpreter, again, same thing. Um, he gave a reading to one of them. I gave a reading to another. Uh, we're talking readings lasting about between three and five minutes. And um, they both were delighted, first of all, because we were treating them as human beings and, and being nice and, mm -hmm. and talking to them. We weren't hitting on them or chatting them up or anything. We were just talking to them in a nice way. But also then they really liked the readings. And one of them said... Uh, you know, I've needed someone to say that for a while. I know that I want to be a nurse. I know I want to go and do the training. I Everyone's told me I've got the right aptitude for it. It's what I want to do, but I keep putting it off. And you saw that in the card. You told me that's what I want to do, what I should be doing, and that I'm the only person holding myself back from wow. my ambition. Wow. I'm going to make some changes. I don't want to work in a shop like this for the rest of my life literally change someone's you know, you life. Know, I mean, how can it not bring a little tear to your eye? Exactly. You know, it, it's, it's something positive and con you know, making a contribution and helping people to believe in themselves and pursue. I, I have an older brother who's five and a half years older than me. He's an amazing man, a wonderful man. I admire him tremendously. And you hear so much, th th there's a link. Um, th you hear so much these days about self-determination and self-motivation and plow your own furrow in life and choose your direction. Don't let other people pull your strings. He was into this from this get-go mm -hmm. from uh he's always been a very 
self-determined man and he's traveled the world he's found his he's never relied on handouts or signing on or anything like that he's always found a way to work pay for himself uh, cover his work and he emigrated to australia in the end of about 1995 Ma- married a lovely woman and they had a, a lovely daughter here my niece uh, who's now <laughs> ironically enough has now emigrated and lives over here but anyway the the point is um He's always been full of this spirit, self-determination, do your own thing. I mean, you can help other people along the way, absolutely, and he has. But, uh, you know, it, you get one life. You don't let other people tell you how to do it. You, you, you live your own life the way you want to. He's full of that spirit, and he always has been. It's one of the things that I really admire about him. And if you can, in five minutes, in a, a small store... Of the <laughs> near the beach in Rio, yeah. if you can give Change people a little life. bit of a little yeah. bit of self belief, I think that's a nice positive thing to do. Very. And David, as I say, is is a master cold reader. He's absolutely brilliant. And has Re- he got a book out also? I don't know if he has yet, but uh, he should. David Sounds Dean, like the mind artist. Maybe you, wanna, you should write that book for him. I, maybe I should, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he, he could write his own. But he's a great guy to hang out with. He was a great host, by the way. Yeah, and uh, just one of the many wonderful, generous, lovely people that I've met throughout through this uh, part-time hobby of mine. Well, before we uh, wrap up, we've got quite a bit I want to put into this yet. And we haven't gotten to Karagami, you know, about the cards. I want to talk a little <laughs> bit about that. But also, while we're on the fact of books, I know like with Banachek and I, we've had some issues with piracy hmm. in which people have – scanned the book and yeah, sold yeah. the PDFs online. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that we decided many years ago that we were not going to be selling our books, the psychological yeah. subtleties and the series and the rest of that and pre-thoughts, et cetera, in, in a PDF form. So this way that if it ever showed up in a PDF form, we could easily say to whoever was the domain owner yeah. that, hey, we have not authorized right. this. <laughs> and so that way that, that's naughty. Yeah, yeah, it was. And there are thousands of sure. uh, places out there. People can go and pirate that. I assume has this been a problem or a case? I mean, when you're a best-selling author, as you have with your books, that is that I mean, is that like whack-a-mole and you finally give up? Or what have you done? Or is that well, an issue for, with you? For, for, first of all, thank you for referring to me as a best-selling author. I don't think I am, but you're very kind. Um, yeah, of course it's happened. Well, within uh, that niche, within a niche we we're okay, talking about. Right, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Within that pond of 10 people, <laughs> Ian's outstanding. He's definitely in the top 10. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course it happens and it shouldn't and uh, so it would be nice if that didn't happen and I couldn't care less. Really? So it's going to happen and you just kind of say, well, what are you going to so, do? First of all, uh, like, I mean, many years ago I put out this little booklet called Sense of Touch which I thought was a really interesting principle for people to play with and it was an actual physical book. I got, you know, a couple of thousand actual books printed and then was selling it. And it was copied and ripped off and scanned. And I don't know how many pirate copies mm. there were, but when they when they put a, a, a an explorer on Mars, I was pretty sure the first thing it would see would be a pirate copy of Sense of Touch. You know, it got everywhere. <laughs> and I couldn't care less. It would be nice if it didn't happen. But first of all, the old serenity prayer. Change what you can't accept and accept what you can't change. So I can't change it. It's always going to happen. But secondly, uh, I woke up this morning and I've got two eyes that work and I've got two legs that work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm already in paradise. Great attitude. Um, All my life, I've had ready access to clean, fresh drinking water. Do you know how many people in history didn't have that and how many people in the world don't have that today? Right. Uh, I'm already in paradise. Fresh sweet. I mean, yeah. I... I, I've flown the, the Atlantic. I've started off in London on one day and I've ended up in LA eight hours later. Mm-hmm. I'm in paradise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can walk down the street with my phone and I can listen to Anna Vidovic, the Croatian guitarist, playing Bach on my earphones. I don't know how this technology works. It's magic. Mm-hmm. And I can do that anytime I want. I'm in paradise. Good point. And I, I, I don't see that I've got any room whatsoever to complain about the life i've been given or the life i've got uh, I, i'm not bothered and you know if i i'll never meet one of these people who's like ripping stuff off and pirating it but if i did i'd like to reach out to them you know and say come on oh, let's go over here let's have a cup of coffee or a pint or whatever you're into i want to know why you went, ended up at this point in your life where you think this is a good thing to do or do you not have other options is money really this tight for you what, what's going on let's, let's talk about it uh, you know, there are other ways of earning money. Maybe, maybe I can suggest a few things to you. Maybe I can help. I don't know. It may be somebody who needs some help. I don't know. I 
I don't have any ground. The, the, only, the biggest crime I could commit right now would be not to be utterly blissfully happy because I've just been wow. given so much. The biggest crime you commit would be not to be blissfully happy. I like that. I, I've just been given so Great much. Great attitude. I've had a fantastic life. Yeah. And I'm still having it. Yeah. Until I follow your it's... advice about crossing the road and it becomes a rapid end. <laughs> you want to look right, not left, sorry. I don't, I don't mind. I mean, and by the way, I'm not being ableist. I know that people who are blind, I know people who are in a wheelchair, they can have a great and fulfilled life and achieve a lot, but it's, it's nobody's first choice. Mm -hmm. And last year, uh, a friend of mine who uh, I knew from my skeptics days, he and I used to go making crop circles together and stuff like that. He got in touch and I met him and he was in a wheelchair. He'd had MS for a while. He was in a wheelchair. And... I have loved going for a walk or climbing stairs every single second since I met him. Hmm. You, you just take walking or going up and down stairs for granted. But these appendages under your waist, these strong, powerful legs that can cope with anything, they are amazing structures. They are amazing things. Right. And if you've got a couple of legs that walk and you can, if you can stand up and sit down and go up and down stairs, you're in paradise. You really are. I, I know that you have taking this a little bit different direction. I know you have lectured a lot. I've heard uh, your lectures. And also, I meant to mention earlier about the fact that you were also talking about uh, being an author and a writer. You had uh, written columns for the Magic Circular, and uh, you were an MUM then also for, no, just just the Circular? And Magic. And Magic, that's what it was. Sorry, you wrote uh, uh, that. And the one, I guess, I was did. that in... So 12 years for the Magic Circular, mm -hmm. uh, starting with Matt Field, and his work was carried on by the great Will Houston. Uh, so I did my own uh, like uh, double page thing about mentalism in there. And then for five years, the great, uh, wonderful Stan Allen, our friend Stan, um, uh, invited me to write uh, a column on mentalism in for Magic Magazine as well. Were those your own effects or yes. were they other people's and then you kind of put your well, twist on so, them? That, so by the way, they, they were different articles. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so the Magic Circular one was kind of like what's been going on and I suppose trying to be a little bit humorous and funny about what's been you going on. You mean within on. the community? Within or? the community, okay. yeah. And occasionally review something. And then at the end, there was a quick trick section. So I'd share something, uh, an item effect, an idea. Uh, over in Magic Magazine, that was, at, you know, that was effect method, effect method. That was uh, presenting a trick. Um, I would say all original material to whatever extent anything in mentalism ever can be yeah. original. Yeah. You know, we're drawing in a very narrow palette of colors. But yeah, um, so... Uh, there were five years when they overlapped, so I was doing two a month. Great fun, great honor to be invited to do them. Loved doing them. And again, uh, I'm just going to be a stuck record now, uh, a metaphor that means nothing to anybody over the, under the age of 24. But um, <laughs> it, it again uh, led me to meeting a lot more of the people in this fantastic community. Right. Uh, in, in, Probably including you and I, really, because it was because I wrote for the magazine. Stan was kind enough to invite me to lecture at the convention, the Magic Live convention, and flew me over, which was very, very kind and generous of him. And uh, I got to meet great people like you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, and I know also that you lecture and have lectured over there. And one of the things you t have talked about uh, when I've heard your lecture is about performing magic. And you think that it's uh, hard to perform magic. I think it's hard to perform mentalism because you have to memorize a script. And a lot of times magicians don't have a script. They'll just have a trick and they depend, depend upon the method and for the trick to do itself, basically. And there's kind of like, hey, I'm presenting this or mm. demonstrating this. So uh, what is your, what are your thoughts about yeah, why I, it's hard? Do you know, I've had quite a few interesting discussions with this, with, with other magicians over the years. Um, I think it's a hard thing to do. Let's just talk about presenting magic, uh, doing a, a magic set, a close-up set, 20-minute set or whatever. Um, you need a five-track mind. Explain that. I mean, you've, so you're following the effect, the, the, the narrative, the story as perceived by the spectators. That has to add up. That has to be all there. They have to follow this story where a normal thing happens, a normal thing happens, an understandable thing happens. Then at the end, hey, that, that shouldn't be possible. So That's you have amazing. to think as an audience so, member. So you have to keep the effect. You have to preserve. You have to tell that story. Da uh -huh. dum, da dum, da dum. That's cool. impossible. Yeah. At the same time, of course, you're taking care of the method, all the secret stuff that they're not allowed to, to see to and, to and, and yeah. they can't know about without giving any of that away. So you've right. got to look com completely composed and there's nothing's going on. Right. On top of that, uh, there are great silent acts, of course, but the kind of magic I'm talking about 
You've got to keep the mouth going. You've got to keep the 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 mind mouth Part of connection the verbal going. Direction, I guess. Yeah, Part and of my your pa- your patter, your Tommy delivery, Lord, your enunciation, how you use your words, your language. That's got to be there. That's a skill in itself. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, you've got these: the hands, the manipulation skill. E- and even if you're not doing any sort of great sleight of hand, there's correct handling of props and display of stuff, and so on. You've got stuff to do with your hands, and a lot of people are clumsy and don't find that easy. And then on top of all that, if four tracks wasn't enough, and it is, <laughs> um, with a lot of most kinds of magic, you're interacting with members of the audience. Now they're a completely wild card that you don't, you can't rehearse that perfectly. That it's real time. We're not actors making a movie. We don't get second takes. This all has to work first time, first take, interacting with a member of the audience who might play along, might not, might be a bit challenging, you don't know. And you've got to make all of that work yeah. in real time, one take, first take, only take. That's hard to do. And it's, of course, some like anything else in life, driving a bus, laying bricks, some people are going to have more of a natural aptitude for it than others. Mm-hmm. But even those with some sort of an aptitude for it, it's hard work. Let me add a sixth track to that also, and that is the blocking, because you got to think about where you're, if you're, you, I'm not referring just to people on stage as far as when you're picking up a prop and bringing it over here or whatever you're doing, but also if you're doing close up about moving your hands from one pocket yeah. to another or something, yeah. there's blocking in close up then as yeah. well. Yeah. And trying to think about that in addition to the other five tracks you're talking about oh my gosh i hadn't thought about it's, it's, it's all it's all your stagecraft it's like playing golf well. you know you gotta have your hands <laughs> with the right grip you know you gotta you know lean over a little bit or you know your stance and your grip and then all the boy there's a lot of stuff to think about that's true it, it, so there's a lot to do there's a lot to get right minute by minute second by second mm-hmm. i think it's a difficult thing to do and this is why i feel enormous love and respect for everyone I know who's good at this and can make it look so easy. And I mentioned these um, close-up shows on a Friday night at The Circle where I get to work with three of my, uh, three of my friends from The Circle. And it's, it's just great, you know, because I, I, once I've done my bit and I'm sort of standing at the back of the room, there might be somebody like the great Wayne Fox or somebody like that or, mm-hmm. or uh, Kath Rhodes doing her thing. And I'm there looking on thinking, yeah, you, you, you see that person over there doing that incredibly difficult thing and making it look easy. And you see this audience here smiling and laughing and being amazed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's my friend. Yeah. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of person I get to hang out with. Yeah. We went for a drink just before the show, you know. Yeah. Those are my friends. Yeah. Who can do these superhero things. And as you know, we, we live in the age of superhero movies. Like you just blink and every, they bring out three more, you know, and it's great and it's fun. And if you're into all that, but. And I, I may break the heart of a few listeners now. It's actually all make believe. No. It's not true. No. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> fake and special effects. Where of course we have to do it in real time, live in a, in a brightly lit room in front of real spectators. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very close to an actual superpower to be able. To, uh, I'm not talking about making a card vanish. I mean to be able to perform mm-hmm. and entertain to that level. I think is a very close to a real superpower. And I'm very honored and happy that I, I know and love so many people around the world who are really good at this really difficult thing. And it's, I, I get such, I get so much of a glow from just being able to watch them uh, and see just how good they are. And if people think that I'm, I'm sort of reasonably good myself, that's nice. But I get much more from watching other people and, and the love in the community for all everybody who's achieved a little bit of peer group respect. Mm-hmm. No matter what you you might be a family entertainer, close up stage, illusions, comedy, whatever. But if you're good at what you do, you start to enjoy this wonderful stuff called peer group respect. And the, the magic community is full of it. And I, I really love that part of it. As we do start to wrap up, I want to go to the first thing we talked about, or I mentioned, I said we we're going to talk about is a little karagami. Mm. And so can you explain what karagami is and what you do? And this is completely <laughs> unique to you that you have not apprenticed anyone. No one knows how to do this. You're taking this to your grave. But so some of the cards <laughs> that you've made, explain what karagami is and what you make. Well, this is an absolutely wonderful thing to do using the medium of audio recording. This is <laughs> really great. So yeah. let me look at this picture of a gorgeous sunset. Um, <laughs> so everybody's heard of origami. Take a piece of paper, fold it, and it, now it's a, a flapping bird. Great. Right. Kirigami is where you're allowed to make some slits and cuts in the paper first, and then you do the folding. So okay. slitting and folding, that's kirigami. A wonderful uh, man and puzzle enthusiast called Angus Lavery, uh, many years ago, 
as I said, like I said, like I said at the start, all of our stories start many years ago. <laughs> Back when I was uh, a kid. You really need to interview some people who are like 19, you know, get something fresh. Many years ago, he started doing kirigami with playing cards and seeing what kind of shapes and structures and designs you could get out of them. Um, and it's really good because it's such a limited canvas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've just got however big a, an average playing card is, that's your canvas to work with. And he came up with wonderful designs. Uh, I was introduced to him <laughs> by our mutual friend, Martin Taylor. And I was really taken with this technique and I thought it was amazing. And I wanted to know how it was done. And he was kind. He shared with me a lot of the secrets and taught me some methods. And I just carried it on from there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was able to ally it to, you know, I, I know a lot about uh, sort of graphic designs and on computers and things. So I was able to work out the designs and then actually put them into physical cards. And I've just loved doing it ever since. And, and uh, I came up with a couple of designs years ago that can be adapted to fit any two initials, you know, so in your case, it would be SW, you know, uh, my case would be IR, but anybody's initials can be integrated into the design. And people really like those. And you sort of put them in a nice- They're really works of art. Clear. Well, I've, I'm very, very hesitant to go near that word I will art. go there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it's a word that a lot of people use in a rather pretentious way. But um, so we'll, I'll, I'll pass on that. I've been down to the Royal Academy annual exhibition showing- things on the wall that I'm told are art, and I'm pretty sure they can be done under Trade Descriptions Act. So I, anyway, okay. so I won't go there. But they're great things to do, and they make such nice gifts because they're personalized gifts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just like the fact that I can make them for people, and you put them in these little acrylic display cases that are easy to find now, and they look really nice, and people like having them. So that that's Kirigami cards. And do you recall what month of Genie it was, if people wanted to go back and I have find no that? idea. It was, it was probably at least six or seven years ago. Oh, it was say. way more than that. Ten years I, ago, maybe? I have no idea. It was, it was ways back. Yeah. As I said, I would suggest if you go to the magicwordpodcast.com, there will be on the blog there a couple of pictures uh, that I had taken of these cards. They yeah. are quite amazing. Well, as we do wrap up over here, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word, and so I always like to close by asking my guests, what is your philosophy of life? What is, what is it that's important to you? Whatever your version of success is, which could be wealth, career advancement, meeting the right partner, raising a family, whatever it is, the key is always going to be the same. The key is always going to be other people hmm. and how you treat them and how you make them feel. And can you bring the best out of them? Can you help them to believe in themselves? Can you love them? What can you give to their life? And when you know that and you start to treat other people the way you should, your path towards success, however you define it, Mm -hmm. is a hundred times easier. And if you don't do that and you don't understand that and you don't know how to talk to people and communicate with them, your path is a hundred times harder. So that's my attitude. Wow. And you live that every day of your life. I try to. Yeah. Yeah. I try to. That's a goal that we should all reach for. Ian, thanks very much. And thanks especially for being my friend, but also thanks for this last hour. We've uh, had a chat together. I'm sure the listeners like this as well. I, I don't know if anybody will even bother listening to it <laughs> when you put my name on it, but it's been a pleasure. As you say, it's nice to have the time to away from the hubbub of a convention or yeah. whatever to just sit down and talk. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Ian Rowland. This is Scotty Out. Thank you, Ian, for your time. I appreciate you sharing your words and so many different things, different aspects of your life with us here this week on the podcast. It was great. I'm glad we had a chance to actually sit down and have a proper chat there as well. I look forward to every time we get to see each other. And for the rest of your listeners, it was it didn't stop there. After we were finished, I was with Mark Whitehouse and also with uh, Dal Sanders, and we went over to a local pub and we went on quite late into the uh, rest of the day and spoke for, I don't know, until it got to be almost dark and it was time for us to go to the West End, time for a play. Anyhow, it was a great day and I appreciate Ian, you sharing your time with us. And also, thank you very much for sharing the wonderful prize. I want to remind everybody to go to themagicwordpodcast.com where they can see the form that they can fill in. Be sure to do that quickly here this week and fill that in and you might have a chance for your name to be randomly selected to win one of the three books that is being offered 
offered by Ian. And again, Ian, thank you very much. And also thank you for sharing all the free stuff. And again, as a reminder for everybody to go to the, the, your website, which is ianroland.com slash magic. And there they can see where they can download some free stuff then as well. Pretty darn cool. I also want to thank uh, those of you who have gone out and listened to what I have recommended and suggested uh, by going and giving a five-star review on iTunes or whatever platform you listen to your podcast. And I thank you very much for doing that, but I could use some more if you could just take a few minutes of your time and leave a five-star review for the Magic Word podcast. That would be just brilliant, and I would appreciate that. And we've got a lot more stuff coming up over the next few weeks, so still stay with us. Be sure to subscribe to the pod letter so this way that you know who's coming up. And also, when we have contests, you know where to go and how to enter the contest. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember, when you treat people the way you should, your path towards success will be 100 times easier. This is Scotty out. Thank you.